programming lesson. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi, Hardeep. Is now a good time for us to plan that computer programming lesson we've been assigned? Hey, Don. I was just thinking about that, actually. Yes, let's get it out of the way now, shall we? I've got the instructions here. So, it says, Design a 45-minute lesson for a class of 16 teenagers where they learn how to write a simple computer program in BASIC. Now, I know, of course, that BASIC is the computer language people used to use back in the 1980s when they wrote programs on microcomputers, but I'm not sure I feel very comfortable teaching anyone about it. Well, I did a bit of research yesterday and found out quite a few things, so I think we'll be okay. Great. So, what do you have in mind? Well, I think we should presume that none of the kids will know anything about BASIC, so why don't we start with a short multiple-choice quiz? It could focus on things like what BASIC is, what the letters stand for, when people used it, things like that. That sounds good. I guess it shouldn't take long. Just the first five minutes of the lesson, something like that. I don't think we should make the students do it on their own, though. That'd make it too much like a test. Shall we let them do it in two so they can discuss their choices? Yes, good idea. Then we'll go through the answers with them as a whole group. Good. What next? Well, I've had an idea for the program they could write. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I think the key thing is, though, that before they actually sit at their computers, and I think we should presume that they're doing this lesson in a computer room, they make a flow chart of what they want the program to do. That's usually the best way to start writing a program. This flow chart will show all the different stages of the computer program, right? Exactly. It's probably best if the teacher stands at the board and everyone works on that together. Yes, otherwise they'll all come up with different flow charts and it'll get confusing. Precisely. I imagine making the flowchart will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Then they use that to write their computer program. Well, actually, I think there's a stage before that. You see, the flowchart will be in English. They're going to need to be taught a few basic commands so they can write their computer program. Hmm. Now I'm getting out of my depth. What kind of thing would that be? Well, for example, when you want text to appear on the screen, the command is PRINT in capital letters, followed by the text you want to appear in double inverted commas. Oh, yes. I think I've seen that before. Right. So they'll need to be taught five or six commands before they use them to write their program. Okay. So how shall we do that? With the teacher talking to the whole class again? Well, we could but it might be more fun to make it more like a competition where there are a few teams competing against each other. Each team has maybe four or five people in it and they have to do some kind of matching task. You know, they match the command print with to make text appear on the screen, something like that. That sounds good. Teenagers love competing with each other. Exactly. And then for the final part of the lesson, they use their flowchart and the commands they've learned to produce the program. Let's presume, shall we, that there are eight computers in the room, so that's two students for each computer. That sounds reasonable. So, tell me more about your idea for the computer program they're going to write. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. OK, so it's a very simple program. I've actually written it down here so we can go through it together. OK, so the first line says 10 CLS. What on earth does that mean? Well, every line of a basic computer program starts with a number. They usually go up in tens. So the first line is 10, the second 20, and so on. And CLS is the command we use in BASIC to clear the screen. Oh, I see. So that's just telling the computer to start with a blank screen. Exactly. Then we move on to the next line. So this one says 20, print, guess a number between 1 and 10. Right, I see. That appears on the screen. It's not that difficult, is it, when you get the hang of it? Let's see if I can work out the next one. 30, input I. Oh, not sure about that. Well, all that's saying is that the person playing types in a number. Input is the basic command for type in, and I just means any number you like. Oh, okay. Then what happens next depends on what the number is. So we've got 40 if I is less than 1, or if I is greater than 10. Then print, bad choice. Right. So if they type, say, 0 or 11, that appears on the screen. Exactly. And then this next line takes them back to where it asks them to type in a number between 1 and 10. That's line 50. I see. And line 60 says, if I equals 6, then print. Correct. Ah, OK. So if they've typed 6, they've got it right. And if they haven't typed 6, which is the next line, then try again comes up on the screen, and that takes them back to where they choose another number. It's clever. Well done. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a student union officer explaining about the union's functions and services to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone. Now here you all are, new university students. And the first question you probably have is, what is a student union? Another question is, do I have to join? Well, regarding this second question, let me say that membership used to be compulsory in the past, but that did cause some controversy, particularly from students who wanted to remain free and unaffiliated, and this university responded. So, joining up is no longer compulsory. It's totally up to you, although I'll admit there is a fairly strong obligation to join, since all students benefit from the large variety of services that we offer. We do understand, however, that many might be unwilling to join because of a supposed political slant to the union. Traditionally, student unions have been seen as being dominated by the left, and I suppose that's still true to a large extent. Here, however, at this university, our union discourages such one-sided viewpoints, and students across the whole political spectrum are welcome. 
Thus, if you feel that you are a conservative type, in other words, leaning to the right, you are particularly urged to join to provide a more balanced representation. Now, let me move back to the first question: What are we? We are a formal organization, but totally independent of the educational body. We make our own rules, rent our own premises, and organize ourselves as we wish. And our mission is basically to help you. For example, do you remember how you all arrived in late February to have an orientation week? That gave you an invaluable induction into life here, right? Well, the student union organized all the festivities at the end of that. The barbecues, partying and drinking, and even the musical entertainment as well. We'll do that again on occasions, and as always, those events take place on the football ground. Now, do you have any questions before I move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now let me tell you more about the student union and its basic functions. In general, there are three: social, organizational, and representational. Let's look at the first one. Basically, the union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear. In other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to twenty percent discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, there's a student union newspaper, and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. All right, let's move on to our more serious functions, which are helping you get through life here, as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue. If you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example, perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym, then come to us. We have a range of counsellors and helpers, and even some lawyers, who you can meet in the conference room. So just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles, and they'll be all ears. Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two students discussing a survey they have to write as an assignment. First, 
you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. How is your market research project going, George? Very well, actually, Anna. I've just got the results of the survey back, and so now I have to draw some conclusions from the information I've collected. That's good. I'm still writing my questionnaire. In fact, I'm starting to panic, as the project deadline is in two weeks and I don't seem to be making any progress at all. What is your topic? Forms of transportation in the city. What about you? I've been finding out people's attitudes to the amount of violence on television. That's interesting. What do your results show? Well, as I said, I haven't finished writing my conclusions yet, but it seems most people think there is a problem. Unfortunately, there is no real agreement on the action that needs to be taken. Nearly everyone surveyed said that there was too much violence on TV. A lot of people complained that American police serials and Chinese kung fu films are particularly violent. The main objection seems to be that, although a lot of people get shot, stabbed, decapitated and so on, films never show the consequences of this violence. Although people die and get horribly injured, nobody seems to suffer or live with the injuries. Any children watching might take the heroes of these programmes as role models and copy their behaviour. So, what did most people suggest should be done? A lot of people were concerned about how these films affect children. They are particularly worried that children will try to behave like the stars. The survey shows that violent programmes should be broadcast after 10pm, when most children are already in bed. There is also a significant minority of people who feel that violent films should be banned altogether. Well, how did people feel about the violence on news broadcasts? Most of the responses I have looked at have felt that violence on news broadcasts is more acceptable, as it's real. Although it's unpleasant, it is important to keep in touch with reality. Still many people thought that it would be better to restrict violent scenes to late viewing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Your survey sounds very good. How many people filled it in? I gave out 120 and I got 70 back. That's a very high rate of return. Who did you give your questionnaires to? I gave a copy to every student in my hall of residence and a few to friends from other colleges. Don't you think that this will influence your results? How do you mean? The people in your hall of residence are all about the same age. They're all students and from similar backgrounds. Therefore, it is likely that they will have similar opinions. Your results represent student opinion, not public opinion. So how are you going to do your research? Well, I'm going to interview my respondents in the shopping mall. What I'll do is ask people if they have five minutes to spare to answer a few questions. If they agree, I will ask them some multiple-choice questions and tick off their answers on my sheet. Isn't it very difficult to ask meaningful questions using multiple choice? Yes, it is. The secret to writing a successful survey is to write simple multiple choice questions that target the information you're looking for. There, it's better to write a lot of short specific questions than longer general ones. So that's why it is taking you so long to write? Yeah, but I hope I'll be ready to start interviewing at the weekend. That is the end of part three. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on two famous American presidents. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln lived in different times and had very different family and educational backgrounds. Kennedy lived in the 20th century, while Lincoln lived in the 19th century. Kennedy was born in 1917, whereas Lincoln was born more than 100 years earlier in 1809. As for their family backgrounds, Kennedy came from a rich family, but Lincoln's family was not wealthy. Because Kennedy came from a wealthy family, he was able to attend expensive private schools. He graduated from Harvard University. Lincoln, on the other hand, had only one year of formal schooling. In spite of his lack of normal schooling, he became a well-known lawyer. He taught himself law by reading law books. Lincoln was, in other words, a self-educated man. In spite of these differences in Kennedy and Lincoln's backgrounds, some interesting similarities between the two men are evident. In fact, many books have been written about the strange coincidences in the lives of these two men. For example, take their political careers. Lincoln began his political career as a U.S. congressman. Similarly, Kennedy also began his political career as a congressman. Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1847. Kennedy was elected to the House in 1947. They went to the Congress just 100 years apart. Another interesting coincidence is that each man was elected President of the United States in a year ending with the number 6-0. Lincoln was elected President in 1860 and Kennedy was elected in 1960. Furthermore, both men were President during years of civil unrest in the country. Lincoln was President during the American Civil War. During Kennedy's term of office, Civil unrest took the form of civil rights demonstrations. Another striking similarity between the two men was that, as you probably know, neither lived to complete his term in office. Lincoln and Kennedy were both assassinated while in office. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, after only 1,000 days in office. Lincoln was assassinated in 1865 a few days after the end of the American Civil War. It's rather curious to note that both presidents were shot while they were sitting next to their wives. These are only a few examples of the uncanny and unusual similarities between the destinies of these two American men, who had a tremendous impact on the social and political life of the United States and 
the imagination of the American people. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.